Good morning. Good morning. And good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for attending the uh, Welcome to Cross-Border Online Selling webinar. Just to give you a, a bit of history, we've run a couple of these uh, seminars in London, and the turnout was quite high, so we thought it would be a lot easier for most people to attend the online webinar. Uh, through the last uh, year or so, so many UK retailers have thought about selling online internationally. Uh, and there's a, a lot of questions that need to be asked. So we'll be holding over the next few months a, a number of these webinars with different experts in their field from shipping to fulfillment to e-commerce, digital marketing, and, and so forth. So today, I would just like to welcome our presenters. It's myself, uh, Bob Curran, from Buy For Now. We're an e-commerce company. Uh, we've Cora Phelan from TaxBack, and she helps uh, retailers plan their their VAT and tax liability as they're as they're selling cross border. We've Julie Colcock from Eurobase, who specializes in e-commerce fulfillment and the holding of forward stock for companies that want to trade again uh, in different uh, countries. And we've Stephen Quinn from Evolution Digital who is a digital marketing agency who works again with retailers on planning their digital strategies in multiple international markets. So today, we're really here to talk about some of the concerns and considerations that are often overlooked by retailers. Uh, and we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. At the moment, uh, we have everyone set on mute. So please feel free to use the chat box and there's also a question box on your screen as well, and you can send in questions and we can go through them at the end. But if you do have a question at any time, feel free to pop it into the chat box, and the announcer will have a look, or the presenter will have a look, and uh, we'll try to address it there. So just moving forward, I suppose, uh, just wanted to discuss a bit of why we're actually here today. Obviously, we are either selling cross-border and would like to do better, or you're selling online and you'd like to expand. And I suppose this slide really highlights the fact that the European market is growing and growing. So most of these figures uh, all relate to the Eurozone. Uh, online sales have grown from 188 billion uh, to over 166 billion and continuing to grow from there. I suppose the most telling statistic is that uh, two-thirds of all online sales across the Eurozone were actually made with UK retailers through UK sites, and I'll talk about why that is uh, in a moment. Uh, unfortunately, though, the UK is not the only country uh, getting the online sales. Uh, Germany and France are also doing very well uh, that with a lot of well-established retailers that have moved online in the last five or ten years uh, and have spent a while upgrading their platforms as well. So between the big three, UK, Germany, and France, uh, they've accounted for 71% of all online sales across the Eurozone. So we definitely have a, a strong position in which to market your products across the, the Eurozone. And of course, online growth, just a, a quick revisit of something we probably already know of how online sales has grown over the last 10 years. And as of uh, late 2012, uh, online sales represent more than 10% of all total retail sales. And obviously, as a result, UK retailers ha have responded. They've responded with better sites, trying to improve the customer experience, adding more functionality like click and collect and mobile sites to increase their multi-channel presence. Uh, logistics has always been a problem for a lot of retailers. How do you pick, pack, and ship, and fulfill? And, and Julie from Eurobase will talk a bit about that. Uh, tight systems integrations, as you as you put out a, a bigger product catalog across different sites and different markets, you need a much tighter systems integration, uh, and all of this has resulted in more sales, and the, the biggest retailers in the UK will certainly testify that once they tick a few of these boxes, their sales do go up. Uh, the biggest thing to remember, which I'm going to talk about in a moment as well, is that UK sites are trusted by European customers. It's a source for them to go to when they don't have indigenous retailers that they can buy from. They'll buy from the big UK brands. There's a, a trust factor there. And Europe as a whole uh, is really set to explode. So all of the data shows that the growth is going to be double digits going forward over the next uh, five or six years. So again, uh, UK, Germany, and France dominate the amount of online sales. But you can see the figures here for the UK. 
in 2012, steadily expected to grow up, according to Forrester, with a 10% increase, which is great, because we all know uh, brick and mortars traffic has suffered, and we'd love to see these kind of growth figures in our retail stores uh, that the online retailers are enjoying uh, online uh, across the Eurozone. Well, one area that I, I pay particular attention to is the Nordic countries as well, uh, expected to have double-digit growth. But one of the reasons we've been targeting the Nordics for our clients is the lack of indigenous retailers. So if you think of the UK and Germany and, and France and, and Spain, there are a plethora of fashion retailers, electronics retailers, and other multi-channel retailers that have been established for a very long time. In the Nordics, uh, there aren't that many that have made the move, and there aren't that many indigenous. So according to some reports that we've read recently from Forrester and Gartner, uh, a great deal of internet traffic and internet sales into the UK is expected to come from this region. So it might be an area to spend a bit more time uh, when you're strategizing uh, to explore that a little bit deeper as well. So what, what's really happening, I suppose, across Europe is that the for the northern countries, online shopping is the norm. We've been online for more than a decade. Uh, customer experience, fulfillment, delivery times has all gotten better for the customer. The security factor is pretty much gone. People trust shopping online more than they ever have before. Where with some of the, uh, the southern countries, uh, e-commerce is yet to become mainstream. So if you look at uh, Spain, uh, and some of the Baltics, it's projected to grow and grow and grow, but it hasn't really taken off for a number of reasons, which I'll also talk about in a moment as well. But the market is definitely there, and uh, European markets are, are really ripe to capture this business. Again, it goes back to the trust factor. You know, Two-thirds of all online sales across Europe are going through UK sites. So uh, initially, some things that hopefully you'll find helpful, uh, things to consider. When, if you're sitting in the UK and you want to know how do I expand my operations into Germany, Poland, France, Spain, and Croatia, and, and beyond, how do I manage that? Well, I suppose the first thing you need to consider is what markets are right for you and your products. Where do you need to go? And is it English only, or must you have a multilingual solution? So in most countries, English may be enough. But in many cases, you will need a multilingual solution as well. And then what product to buy? You know, What are you actually going to sell? You might have 5,000 products in your UK catalog for sale, but only 1,000 of those products could you actually pick, pack, ship, and fulfill and manage returns on to Croatia, for example. Uh, and it brings me to an example from a friend of mine who works for Doc Martens where they launched a site in Germany, and they only put up, I'd say, about a half a dozen of their products. I think they only have 12 or 15 boots that they actually sell. And in Germany, they put up just about a half a dozen, and they weren't selling. And it turns out that the six that they didn't expect to sell at all turned into their biggest sellers. So it's one of those things you have to consider what product is actually going to sell and what kind of market research do you need to do to make sure those products get up there. And then, of course, how to merchandise the site, the messaging of the site down from the banners down to the site messages themselves need to be tailored for the particular country that you're going to be selling in. Uh, returns and exchanges, which I'll, I'll probably let Julie talk a little bit about in the uh, fulfillment section. But again, if you're selling into China or Poland or Germany or anywhere across the Eurozone, uh, how does the customer send back an item? How does it get processed? What's your RMA process going to be? How do you handle exchanges and so forth when someone is you know, 1,500 uh, kilometers away from you? And customer service ties into that as well. So as you know yourself, for every 10 items that you sell online, you're going to generate approximately three service calls on that. So that's going to magnify as your business grows across the Eurozone, and you need a methodology to capture, log, and action and close off all of the customer service queries that come in. And the multilingual aspect comes into play here again as well. Will you use a call center? Will you need to use your existing customer service? Is it adequate? And how do you log and call and action uh, all of the calls that come in? So. When you're going into a local market, now this is just a small snapshot of some of the things that you need to talk about, and some of the things that we'll talk about in the series of webinars that's coming up. So you need to look, at obviously, at the population characteristics, who buys online, what age group, and are they right for you. Broadband penetration is often overlooked. 
<laughs> even though mobile access is is enormous right now and growing more and more uh, every month, you you want to see what is the penetration there. Uh, who are your competitors? What brand presence are you going to be fighting against? Is someone already there? And if so, what slice of the market are they going after? Payment preferences. For example, Germany, there's direct debit and ELV payments and even COD, cash on delivery. So it's a different method of shopping online that's accepted over there. And you need a payment gateway that will allow you to take those types of payments. Logistics and fulfillment. Uh, what is the measure of disposable income? that the market has. So again, we'll target Croatia as an example. You know, what percentage of the population have disposable income? What type or, or amount of a disposable income do they have? And uh, what's the propensity to shop online? Government regulation and taxes, which uh, Cora from TaxBack will address to a point. Uh, the geography, urban versus rural. Again, that probably ties more into uh, logistics and fulfillment and the types of products that they'll buy the competitive environment, and of course, broadband, sorry, smartphone and tablet uh, penetration. And if you're launching a new site into a new market, will you have a mobile version of that as well? So a lot of this might tie down to your current uh, e-commerce provider. So there are, there are more considerations than this, but it's a, it's a good starting point uh, to start the conversation. So, so some other big considerations, I suppose more on the technical side, is hosting. And there's a, a, I suppose, a bit of discussion or argument around whether or not you actually need web servers in each country that you're going to be doing uh, business in. So some retailers do indeed set up localized IP addresses and localized web servers in each country. We have another client that actually uses Amazon Web Services, where you can allocate out a web server in Croatia or Germany or France. Uh, and you know, will the geographic location of a web server affect the SEO? There's a lot of debate, again, over that. And I have a YouTube video here, which I'll make available uh, when we post these presentations. That's actually from uh, a member of Google talking about how Google uh, allocate that out. And uh, it's vague, but it's worth a watch. Uh, again, content. So when you're creating content for your German or French site, you probably will need to have separate visual assets or a different version of the same home page banner or even different home page banners depending on, again, the market that you're selling into. So there's a good body of work there, uh, content uh, and translation and even the URL. So for example, we might have buyfornow.com but can we get buy for now.de if we want to sell in Germany? Uh, or will you have to change the brand or remarket the brand to sell in a different market? Uh, again, these are things you need to think about in advance. But through my years of, of, of talking uh, and working with retailers that are selling internationally, uh, the same, I suppose, element keeps coming up again and again, and that's the need to have a local brand ambassador in that market. So Doc Martens, again, is a good example. When they moved into Germany, they hired a local PR company. It was very inexpensive. Uh, all they were really doing is putting out the odd press release, but they were also doing the Facebook and the social media side of things and blogging, going to a few events, and just getting the name out locally to build up that brand. And every retailer I spoke to that has done this says this is one of the biggest assets that they had as far as driving traffic to the site and establishing themselves in the new country. So it's something to think about. And again, we can talk about all of these things in detail at any point in the future should anyone have any questions or need any kind of guidance or, or extra assistance. So one thing I'd recommend is thinking outside the Eurozone. Obviously, there are bigger markets out there like Russia, like China, like the United States that you may or may not already be selling in. Uh, and, and more and more British retailers are using their expertise to expand out, but they're not thinking of countries like Russia, which has an enormous internet population that uh, people often overlook. So again, Russia, in fact, boasts the highest number of internet users in Europe, which was a, a little shocking to me. I didn't realize that when I started this exploration. But according uh, to, again, uh, eConsultancy and Forrester, uh, the UK have approximately 52 million uh, internet users, where Russia has 61 million. So there's an enormous market over there, an emerging market of, of middle class shoppers that, again, are happy to buy from trusted UK sites. So definitely worth uh, your consideration. Uh, one of the, the biggest things that's probably already popped into your minds is uh, 
fraudulent orders, and that's something to consider. There are ways to obviously reduce your exposure to fraud through 3D Secure and other methods as well, which I won't address today. But whenever you move into any market, whether it's Russia or Germany or Portugal or even Ireland, uh, you have to have some kind of methodology there to help you process and manage the possibility of, of fraudulent orders as well. So with any market, again, it's all about learning about the market and exploring the market before you move into it. So you need to learn who's who and how people shop online in that market. So to use Russia as an example, they have a search engine called Yandex, which is the largest search engine in Russia. It has a 60% market share and 45% of the total online advertising market goes through Yandex, where most people might think, well, I need a Google ad campaign, when in fact they may need a Yandex ad campaign. So without Yandex, your, your e-commerce operation in Russia is, is probably not very likely to, to succeed. So something, again, to consider. So that's, a, I suppose, a, a quick overview of the landscape of the European markets and some of the very basic but initial considerations that you should look at before you move into a new market. One final piece is choosing your technology. So I think it's safe to say that most people here are already selling online. They have an e-commerce site built on a platform that they've invested money in. Now, if you want to launch an additional site, a German site or a French site, there are a number of different ways to do that. So some platforms would support the launch of additional sites quickly and easily. There might be some hosting and setup costs, server costs, licensing costs, but it's easy enough to launch an additional site. Other platforms uh, require a project. So you may have to design, develop, and deploy a separate instance of your existing site and manage it separately from your, your main UK site. So there's a, a number of ways to look at that. And, and either one of those may work for you depending on what your long-term strategy is. Uh, the separate instance route can become very expensive and very unwieldy. Uh, Superdry, for example, have 17 separate instances of their site in 17 different countries, but they're able to manage that through a single content manager. It makes it a little bit easier, but they're still managing 17 separate sites and hosting 17 separate sites, so there's a, a lot of work involved there. So you have to ask your supplier, if I'm going to launch a site in Germany and then France and maybe five or six other countries or 10 other countries, what are those costs going to be to design, develop, deploy, host, support, license? those sites, the technology side of things, and what is the increase in support of each site. And if you're looking at replatforming at any time in the next 18 months, those are some of the key questions that you're going to ask. Because if you're not selling cross-border now, you most likely will be 18 months from now. So, And again, a final point is if you can manage all of your sites uh, via a single dashboard or a single implementation, that's going to make your life a whole lot easier. And another question is, where are your assets stored? Where are your visual images, your product descriptions, your content uh, videos, and so forth? Where are they actually stored? And how do you manage those? Because the more sites you're managing, uh, the more you want to reduce your workload and, and streamline as much as possible. Uh, and of course, as you launch uh, additional sites, there may be additional systems integration. So you may be dealing with third-party behavioral merchandising companies or payment gateways. If you launch two or three new sites in different markets, are you going to have to pay and support multiple payment gateway integrations, as an example? So uh, a very serious consideration. Now, as far as choosing an e-commerce provider, this is a very light list uh, that I just put together quickly, just really to illustrate the fact that there are a number of choices, from uh, design houses to uh, the likes of eBay and Amazon that will deliver ready-made shops. Further up the chain, you have uh, you know software as a service houses and uh, open source platforms like Magento. Uh, further up the chain still, you get into companies like Snow Valley and, and Ecomera, who provide a, a very strong, full managed service. And then further up the chain still, depending on how much volume you're doing and how many markets you're trading in, there are a number of, of uh, software providers and solution providers out there 
obviously the expense goes higher and higher. If you're really going to be selling cross-border, you, you probably want to stay away from the, the lower tier of the pyramid. And depending on how many markets you're trading in, what volume you're doing, the hosting number of transactions and capabilities, you're probably going to end up, you know, up here, hopefully. So, uh, what I've put together here now is just a, a brief overview of how you would like your international solution to run, a very streamlined process. So, starting at the bottom here, just to run through this really quickly, you, you'd like to have your data held in a central repository, and that may be an SAP system or a back office system or pause system or whatever back-end system you use as the central repository of all your product data, pricing, SKUs, attributes, everything. And you'd like to have that seamlessly and automatically fed into your platform, which should hopefully consist of uh, a number of management tools, so content management, catalog management, promotions, and, and so forth. So once you have all of your products here, you would like to have that information, for example, your product catalog, fed out into your main website, which we'll call that your .com site for, for brand A. Now, using your back-end platform, you may decide to launch a .de or a .fr site. You should be able to go into your platform, uh, set up the parameters for that site, and then pump, them, pump the products, catalog pricing, and styles, and banners, and images for the German site into, whoops, pardon me, into the same shell for a .com there we go, .co.uk, .fr, .ie, and so forth. So you have one shell that holds all of the information, and depending on where the visitor comes from, they either see the .com, the .co, or the .de, and if I land on the .de site, then the platform should automatically pump that product out into my shopping experience. Now, at some point in the future, you may decide to go with a different brand, say a value brand or a youth brand for your product. You'd like to be able to go back into your platform and create a, another brand, another URL, assign out the product that will go into that website and launch another site for brand B, and again, be able to launch at .com, .co, .uk, .de, and so forth all through a single implementation. That's sort of the nirvana where everyone wants to get to uh, and have it hosted, of course, in an enterprise hosting environment. And then in the future, as your business grows, you may want a brand C or a brand D, which might just be a different site for a different com uh, country or a different brand entirely, all managed through a single platform, all being fed from your backend system. Now, one of the advantages of this is there's a single integration point for all of your back office systems as well. So if you have loyalty or other ERP systems, they'll plug into your platform once, and as you launch additional sites in additional markets and additional brands, they don't need to be reintegrated into those sites. And the same goes for third-party integrations, whether it's payment gateway, behavioral merchandising, or otherwise. You should always be looking to integrate once. So create once and manage many. That's where you want to go. Okay. Uh, and at this point, what I would like to do is hand over the presentation to Cora Phelan from Taxback. She's the business development manager with Taxback.com, who are a provider of European VAT services. Uh, and they were the first uh, VAT agent in Ireland to receive an ISO accreditation along with uh, a European Business Award. So I'm going to pass this across to Cora now. Thanks very much, Bob. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm going to quickly run through the VAT liability um, for online retailers and when it kind of comes into play and when it matters. I work with a lot of Irish and UK retailers helping them manage their foreign VAT compliance throughout Europe. Um, so I refer to distance sales in my presentations, not online sales. Um, a distance sales um, can be buying goods over the internet by phone or mail order. Um, they're all examples of what can be a distance sale. So it's not just for online sales, but it's part of it. When it matters and when you should be aware of there could be a VAT liability in another country in Europe is when you, a supplier, are selling to a consumer based in another EU member state. So not when you're distributing or anything like that, when you're doing it's a direct B2C transaction. Um, you as a supplier are liable to account for the VAT in the member state of establishment. So you're either established, I think we mainly have Irish and UK retailers here today, so you're established in Ireland or the UK, 
until such times as you exceed a distant selling threshold in the member state of the consumer. So if you're selling from Ireland or the UK to France, Germany, um, they all have their own different distance sales um, thresholds. So once the supplier um, say, sells to a private individual and in this particular member state, and you exceed that country's distance selling threshold, the supplier has an obligation to that register in that member state. So it's an obligation, it's not something that you do voluntary. Once you reach the threshold, and the thresholds vary between 35,000 to 100,000, um, dependent on the country. So each member state has adopted their own distance selling thresholds. Unfortunately, it's not one, one rule for everyone. So it's between 35,000 and 100,000. For the UK suppliers selling into Ireland, there might be a few on the, on the presentation this morning, um, the threshold is 35,000, which is quite low, and that's in the previous 12 months of sales. And once you reach that 35,000, you have to then VAT register in Ireland and pay over the VAT to the Irish tax authorities instead of the local HMRC. And then vice versa for the Irish retailers that are here today, when you're selling to the UK, once you reach the 70,000 sterling, threshold, which is approximately 100,000 euros, once you reach that threshold in 12 months, you need to that register in the UK and pay over the VAT to the UK tax office instead of the Irish tax office. So some member states may also allow for voluntary registrations if the thresholds have not been exceeded. And some of my clients do this um, just to have everything in line and there's no risk or anything like that and they won't be absorbing any penalties going forward. So other kind of obligations, um, you may be familiar with your own domestic VAT return. You may have to file EC um, sales list, interest act declarations. This is the same for other countries throughout Europe. So it's not just a local VAT return that you may file on a monthly or quarterly basis. You have to bear in mind that you might have to file interest act returns and EC sales list and other um, declarations such as annual VAT statements and things like that. And also for any attendees that are here today that may be based outside of the European Union, a fiscal representation might be something that you'd have to look at as well. So I'll just quickly bring you through a case study um, of one of my clients, mixgarage.ie. Um, mixgarage.ie is an online retailer. They sell through their own domestic website. And they have a .de website and a .fr website. So all of these sales are accounted for um, when we're looking at their, their thresholds to Germany and France and to the UK where they're predominantly selling. But another very important thing to note here, um, Mixed Garage also use other online marketplaces like eBay and Amazon. And the sales from these sites have to be accounted for as well when we're looking at the thresholds. Um, so the bigger your online company gets, and uh, the more countries you're going to be selling to. So it's just an, another thing that you need to be aware of and that it will affect your business. If it's something that you don't take care of, you will be um, incurring penalties from all these countries. So it's a, that was a very quick presentation of the VAT. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to contact me. Again, it's Cora from TaxFac. I'm now going to hand it over to Julie Coakley, um, the founder and managing director of Eurobase. Julie um, provides pan-European fulfillment and customer support services to national and international companies um, across all different types of sectors. And she'll be able to go through everything um, fulfillment-wise with you there now. So thank you very much. I know my presentation is quite short, but feel free to ask me any questions later on if you have any specific queries in relation to the AT. Thank you. Good morning, um, my name is Julie Coakley and um, I'm going to talk to you about logistics forward stock and online returns. Um, many companies considering selling their products online, they put a great deal of thought and consideration into the product range, the web shop design, digital marketing, and often many of them leave the fulfillment piece to the end. And today I'd like to go through some of the questions that you should be asking yourself regarding fulfillment and logistics um, for online selling. I suppose the first question uh, one should ask ourselves is, uh, what is your level of experience? Um, do you know how to get your products from point A to point B through the fastest methods um, for the lowest price? 
and uh, with the least margin of error? Or do you want to spend your time in your warehouse picking and packing your products? Um, another question is, can you integrate your web sh store shopping cart with your warehouse for fulfillment? Um, time and again, we meet companies who haven't thought through the fulfillment and logistics part uh, of their business, and um, this turns out to be disastrous for them. They end up with disgruntled customers, bad publicity, expensive shipping charges, a lot of returns, and um, a very bad reputation. Another consideration is, um, you know, what are the growth plans for your business? Um, in terms of staffing, space, IT, can you cope uh, as your business grow? If you believe your business will grow and you need to ask yourself some key questions in relation to these, will an increase in business require you to add additional warehouse space? Will your current staffing be able to handle growth? Will it be able to handle seasonal peaks and troughs? Again, can you integrate your web shop with your warehouse for order fulfillment? Um, and what are your order volumes? Uh, maybe your future sales line or sales pipeline is normal, but are you having trouble keeping up at the moment? Um, again, will there be seasonal demands for your products that you will have to cope with? <coughs> I mean, again, what type of products are you planning to sell? And where is your end buyer? Are they big and bulky and low value? Uh, the bigger the products, the more expensive they will be to ship. Will your products need assembly in advance of shipping? Will they need customization? Is there specialist packaging requirements? Uh, fragile products, as we all know, need much more packing, which um, results in it being much more expensive. And where is the end buyer likely to be located? Should you be considering putting stock into that location? And why would you? Um, I mean, putting stock in another location will certainly offer you a uh, faster time to market. It will offer you cheaper shipping costs. Um, but in, often, in, in many cases, you'll have to find a fulfillment partner to, to work with in those markets. Either that or the alternative is to do it yourself. Um, if you decide to go the fulfillment partner route, then you should only consider putting your fastest and most popular products in this location and not really be paying storage for um, slow-moving product or non-moving or non-active stock. Um, the general rule is, is that the more SKUs that you have that you are carrying, the more complex your and expensive your fulfillment will be. So you need to bear that in mind when you know establishing creating your budget. If you're offering personalization, gift wrapping, etc., that's going to end up uh, costing you more money. But it is one way of differentiating you from your competition, um, and it will uh, it will add to the cost. But it will it could ensure that you have uh, more loyal customers. <coughs> Logistics and returns, um, and the key to scalability and error elimination is automation. And customers expect superb customer relationship management. They generally expect to receive order notifications, shipping status, and tracking numbers. And that's just a normal experience for, for customers. They also expect the right to be able to, for the order that they have bought to be shipped um, on time and it to be the right order and it to be delivered at the time they expect. Uh, as we know, 48% of people are more likely to buy if there is locally based customer support service available. And that's not always in English. 98% um, of people are more likely to buy if, or 96% are more likely to buy if you offer free shipping. Um, then we get on to the, the um, difficulty relating to returns, and this is one area that is changing all of the time, and it's become a really big issue for people. Um, returns 
while 62% rarely return items that are bought online, 40% of apparel uh, bought online is returned. And in some instances, even 70% of apparel, that's our experience, is 70% of apparel that's bought online is returned. It's become a bit of a norm now for people when they're buying clothing to buy maybe two or three items uh, with a plan to return one or two of them if they don't fit. And I really think companies uh, need to give a lot of thought and consideration into the whole area of returns. Um, we ha recently had an experience with one of our international clients who was selling swimwear. And um, they were offering a return service to their customers. And when the products were coming back, the whole issue was on, uh, in relation to what could be restocked. It's much more expensive to restock product than it is to put stock in the first place. So I can't emphasize enough how important this area is to get right. Um, handled well, it can be one of the areas of your business that sets you apart from your competition. It can attract back more customers. Um, following a review of your experience and your system, you might decide that the best thing to do is to um, work with a, a fulfillment partner. And if you see, you know, if you have concerns or you see the writing on the wall, I would then suggest and recommend that you talk to an expert and work out and negotiate a, co a cost that will work for you and your business. Um, I'm happy to take any questions later on in relation to these areas. And I now I want to go through some of the the uh, pros and cons of outsourcing, um, if this is it, something that you're considering doing. I mean, the pros, it helps you to free up and grow your business focus on sales and marketing. It is generally a variable cost solution. It can offer you lower sh shipping costs. It provides you with an opportunity to scale your order fulfillment to match your growth. It can offer you savings and staffing, reduces the need for investment in inventory technology, and gives you one point of contact for all storage and shipping concerns. It can also allow you to enter foreign mar markets with minimal investment. I suppose the cons are that your inventory is off-site and to some extent you're giving up some control. Cost, I mean, if it's not going to save you money, then I would not be recommending it. A lot of people that embark on a fulfillment partner or relationship with the fulfillment company, if they've got additional space, warehouse space, and staff available, then it's not really going to save you much money. Um, communication is critical to the success of any relationship with the fulfillment services provider. Uh, you've got to be clear about your expectations, and the fulfillment services provider has also got to understand where your business is going and what your expectations are. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions at the end, and now I'd like to hand over to Stephen Quinn, from Evolution Digital. Good morning, this is Stephen Quinn from Evolution Digital. Um, I'm going to go through a presentation about selling internationally using digital marketing. Um, there's an inherent logic to all of this. You've got a product, obviously, to sell internationally online, and you want to put your business in front of the customers who will buy your product. Your website sits in the middle, and all around this then are the factors, such as the fact that customers use Google and other search engines, they use social media to land on your website, and from there, it's all about converting them into customers. There are 11 points that are important to consider in doing this. The country, uh, which countries and markets are suitable for your products, and why consumers, target group, behavior, broadband penetration, cultural behavior, communication, how are you going to engage with your customers? What language do they speak? What are the cultural differences between the different countries? Customer service, what are the local demands and expectations? Your competitors, who are they online? Online competitors are not necessarily the same as your online competitors. Currency, payment, and legal. Which payment methods are common in the country? Think about legal, promotional, and website requirements. Conversions. Define your KPI beforehand, and also how you're going to measure them. Channels, which channels are popular in the country? How does the customer journey look? Content, what content do I need for my customer? As this might vary per country, depending on the local language. Costs and benefits, what is the price 
a customer may cost in advertising. In other words, what's the customer acquisition cost? Here's just a slide that shows how the whole thing ties in together, giving you a visual and focusing in on the message and advertising. Then you need to make sure that your professional digital marketing team, whether they be internal to the company or you're using an external provider, to constantly monitor the results and quantify all the time what the results are showing. In this presentation, I'm going to focus on what we would consider the five hows of achieving the results that you're after. So Google SEO, Google AdWords and pay-per-click, social media, and mobile marketing, and affiliate marketing. So in terms of Google SEO, it's important to know that approximately 70 to 80 percent of all search searches done on Google click through to the organic searches. So it's, ensure, it's important that you ensure that your website uses the correct keywords, has good site navigation, you've got good URL structures, and also that you use videos. SEO is a very medium to long-term strategy. It's not a long-term strategy like pay-per-click would be, but it does deliver more customers in the long term, and it is a long-term process but it does provide long-term benefits for your business. Google Analytics then is, is used to illustrate why your site is effective, or as the case might be, why it might be ineffective, and then how to improve the conversions by using, for example, A-B testing. Keyword allocation, it's important to allocate the correct keywords to the most suitable pages on your site. There is also other considerations that need to be taken into account, such as your domain name age, Google, from an SEO perspective, it favors older domain names that are trusted, attention-grabbing text with large bullet points and text location, um, having customized URLs that include the keywords that you're trying to rank for highly on Google itself, and then having all the back-end technical work done, such as metadata, title tags, uh, heading tags, all tags for images, and having a good strategy around video. Google now loves videos, and then making sure that you don't have duplicate content for example, if you've got a site in the UK, Ireland, and the USA, you can't have the same exact same English content across it, or Google will penalize you for it. Um, so then, from, from an international point of view, global SEO, it involves targeting customers internationally via the many different global search engines. Bob earlier on mentioned Yandex, for example, is very popular in Russia, and Badu is very popular in China. So it's not necessarily just about Google. Um, consideration needs to be given to creating copy in multiple different languages. But within this, it's not just about doing direct uh, translation. There needs to be consideration around regional dialects and colloquialisms. And where a lot of companies sometimes fall short is not developing a strong localization strategy in their global search engine optimization practices. And again, like I said there, the difference between countries are far greater than, only, than not only the language. SEO local, localization, it's not just about translation. Your, your offers have to compel both search engines and human beings themselves. And search managers must develop cohesive strategies that, one, localize websites, and number two, uh, localize SEO campaigns. In order to meet market expectations and local search algorithms more effectively. Um, for example, it, just in relation to this, you know, the UK and Irish market prefers a lot less content. They prefer more use of concise bullet points. The Germans prefer, in general, a lot more detail, and they spend a lot more time reading in-depth information before considering a purchase. And to so the Chinese and Far East market, they prefer a, a, a lot of use of flashy images, more movement and animation on the site before they'll consider uh, a purchase. Um, We've all kind of read snippets of translations on offline ads being humorously being mistranslated in magazines and billboards. But just to illustrate a, a few of these, um, some, some fa famous examples, a leading uh, automobile company, the original in English was, every car has a high quality body. The translation is, in Belgium, every car has a high quality corpse. A, a fizzy beverage brand, the original was, turn it loose. But in Spain, it translated to suffer from diarrhea. And a fast food brand, uh, the original was finger licking goods, but the translation in Chinese was, we'll eat your fingers off. So again, it's very localization in terms of the translation and the colloquialisms around that is absolutely vital. Um, one amazing fact, I was actually surprised to read this myself. Uh, according to Martin Burtonson, uh, who's Google's uh, head of retail verticals, uh, top apparel retailers in the UK, they received just shy of 70% of all their web traffic from outside the UK, 
but interestingly, only 13% of their online sales came from abroad. So there's a huge disconnect there in relation to people coming in from abroad versus the sales. So this all ties into local translations of, of, of your website. Um, so, some more very important things to consider, the actual the selection of the keywords and phrases that you want your website to rank, to rank for in Google's SEO listing, uh, listings. Keyword selection really is a key to success. It might sound very easy to localize by just doing a translation in, for example, English into, say, German or French, but translation is not localization. That approach eliminates the apparent and subtle differences between the international markets. And there are obviously nuances between the different global, regional, and even local languages. It might differ. Um, it, so again, just to go back to this point here, it's, it's not about just using an online translation service like Google Translate, but you really should consider utilizing native speakers. Or there are, on, there are many different uh, online sites like translation.com who do uh, provide actual natives to translate in local, uh, local languages. Um, so, Lastly, on SEO, um, as has been the case now for quite a while, content is really still king. The lifeblood of any international or local digital marketing campaign is having good content on your site. Digital content should be localized to provide seamless transition from search to landing page to site architecture to obviously to purchase. Paid or organic search engine results page localization includes factors such as keywords, key phrases, add copy, title, meta description, descriptions, and all of these need to be consistent with your other digital assets. Site searches should be localized as well. Don't forget to update each localized site map appropriately. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about Google AdWords or, or pay-per-click. Um, AdRank, uh, Google ad, ad Advertising or AdWords, it's about creating a series of ad campaigns and can be much more targeted to specific searchers in the different international markets in their local languages. While searches on Google currently attracts about 20 to 30 percent as opposed to SEO rankings, which would be 70, 80 percent from searchers on Google, it is much more highly targeted and it's, there are generally not as many limitations on, for example, the amount of key phrases that your webshop can rank for an SEO. Like typically, you wouldn't expect to see a website performing much better than for maybe 20, 30, 40 uh, generic type key phrases on your SEO campaign, whereas in AdWords, it's effectively unlimited. So how things you need to consider in terms of doing your Google AdWords campaign is bidding for your position against the competition. However, the higher your bid isn't necessarily always best, but the greater competition, the greater the cost. There's no charge if users just see your ad. They only, you only pay if the user actually clicks through to your website. And then from an accounting uh, administration point of view, it's, it's directly charged to your credit card, which makes your accounting easier moving ahead. And then it's very simple to test if your website can work for you by using pay-per-click, but it does require lots and lots of testing to make sure to get it right and to keep it right. Um, a little bit now about what makes good pay-per-click ads. Ad rank is really one of the most important things. A good rank, ad rank, for example, heavily influences the actual cost that you, play, you pay, or CPC, cost per click. This determines what your quali Google quality score is, which includes, for example, the click-through rate, and also the landing page, uh, how relevant the landing page is to the search term that people click through. Where does your ad appear in relation to others? How do I improve my ad rank? What makes good PPC ads, again, is about your ad rank, which equates to your uh, cost per click score, and then right through to your quality score. And there's a lot of different components within your quality score, such as, as I said before, the relevance of the content, the URL, and the higher your quality score, the better that you're going to appear. A little bit more on pay-per-click ads. The landing page relevance improves the quality, the quality score, so it's important to have specific landing pages for your PPC campaign that target the particular products that you're trying to sell. And in that, it's important to include things like your primary keywords, and not just the ad itself, but in the URL. In your ad itself, it should have a fairly obvious call to action. So buy now, visit our site, get 10% off. Also as well, some, some people don't necessarily always think about are negative key phrases or negative keywords. So for example, if you're selling car parts online, you'd be best also to include generic terms, for example, cars, as your website isn't selling cars itself, but it's selling car parts. Um, so the holy grail 
in the interna internationalization, your AdWords campaign, and that's primarily what we're talking about today. You're opening up your business to a huge international marketplace. So again, tying in what I spoke about a few moments ago on SEO, it's vital that ads targeting international markets are translated into the local language. And the same rules apply over colloquial and in your pay-per-click. So websites that are localized, they generally have achieved a, a, approximately 20% increase in conversion when the landing pages and the ads were translated into the local language. Websites themselves achieved an approximately 70% increase when their websites were fully localized. So in the point before, I mean, where you might just localize one page, if you did decide to localize your whole site, then you're going to see a, a very significant increase. Um, so just having covered off in brief info around Google SEO and AdWords, I'm now going to speak briefly about the area of social media and its importance to any integrated digital marketing campaign. There are obviously many different social media channels which I'm sure most of us are familiar with, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. But social media is not just about engaging directly with your customers or potential customers, but it also acts as a conduit for customers to recommend your company and products. And it's also quite recently in, in the last year or so, it's become an important part of the Google algorithm for SEO. So that's why a, a very integrated uh, P, uh, digital marketing campaign in terms of Google SEO, pay-per-click and social media is important. Um, so it's important to develop and brand your social media channels and integrate them all into your other online channels such as your website. It's important to create new and regular content and also to post regularly, regularly to build up a reason to get customers to connect with you and recommend purchases from your site. Social me media apps and competitions and general advertising across Facebook, Twitter, etc. Um, they're a great way to make new customers aware of your web shop and incentivizing them to, con to connect with you, all with the ultimate goal of getting more sales in. Here's just an example of a company which Cora referred to earlier on, Mixed Garage. Um, they've, they've localized a lot of their different websites. Um, but in terms of their social media, um, they, they're doing it all through English. And social media, as you probably know, takes a lot of time, a lot of resources. Um, and you know, you mightn't have the, 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 the budget or the people to update lots of different versions of it. So if, if you're currently doing business in English, wait maybe until, for example, you see a, a lot of business coming through Germany, and then you might consider having a, a German media, social media um, versions of your Twitter and Facebook. I just put an example here of Hertz, who are obviously a, a very big international company with lots of resources and budget, but they've localized all of their social media into the, into the local languages. Um, so th that pretty much covers off the, the brief bit of information on social media. I have just two other points here to go through, and they are important. Um, mobile marketing. Um, like we've all seen huge, huge growth over the last couple of years. Um, smartphone and tablet usage. Um, it, it, the iPad itself is out about three years at this stage. So we can see huge growth in people accessing the web from these mobile devices. However, it's still the case that most e-commerce sites are actually not smartphone enabled or are poorly constructed for the purposes of people looking at it on their site. So it's, it's really important to ask yourself the question, is your website optimized for mobile phones? Because consumers, when they log in, they know straight away if it is if it isn't, the chances are that they leave fairly quickly, and this will contribute greatly to uh, to your bounce rate, and it will lead to obviously lesser sales. Um, so, also as well, it's important to bear in mind that approximately between 20 and 40 percent of all web traffic now, again, it depends on your specific market and industry sector, that they, they these 20 percent of uh, of all the web traffic are accessing websites from a, a smart mobile device. So if, if you've not uh, enabled your web shop to be smartphone enabled, it's probably a good, good time to start thinking about that now. So the next thing is, it's, it's, probably, uh, it's probably least important in the five uh, areas that I've talked about, but it can be important for some businesses. Affiliate marketing, um, I mean affiliate marketing has been around since the early days of the web, and there are both people that promote it who were champions under the detractors of the strategy. However, if it's done correctly, it can get, yield really, really good results. And again, I've used Mixed Garage as an example. Um, they have a very good affiliate marketing program, which is trying to link in with, with other uh, website owners, um, you know, effectively to resell and for them to earn revenue. And it, 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 it helps the company themselves. So I've just put in a couple of points here. Uh, it's free to join on this site. 
they're the largest online parts uh, company in Europe, and they offer free deliveries over 30 euro. And more importantly, they, they give a really good uh, percentage uh, back on people that, that purchase. But they have a good system in place in terms of they've got an affiliate support team and they'll support um, people who want to be affiliates with them. So um, I just now I'm going to wrap up my five areas here and I'm just going to put up a few takeaways for your consideration. Um, in 2014, it's, it's estimated that 67% 60 of online uh, retailers will increase their leads if they blog and they use social media. Um, a, a relatively new part of Google called Google Highlights, it allows e-commerce sites to tag products and also this, this links in with your SEO. Um, UK sales um, directly through uh, social media are forecast, forecast to grow nearly £300 million in this year. And again, it's all about local and it's all about uh, customizing your content um, by translations. Uh, targeting age, interests, and location. Um, last bit of information there is that, and it really ties into the whole mobile side of things. 33% uh, of people, um, if they, if somebody has a mobile site, they will spend a lot more time on it. 24% of people use a second seat screen, such as an iPad or an iPhone, while watching TV. 40% of social media users deciding what they're going to buy based on reviews, recommendations, or social media. And if you're targeting the, the younger market, almost half of 16 to 24 year olds are using some form of email, messaging, social media while watching TV. I uh, just want to thank you for your time today. And if you have any questions or you'd like to follow up with me, I'd be delighted to do that. At this stage, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Bob Curran from Buy For Now. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, uh, Stephen, and, and thank everyone for, for coming in today. As I mentioned, we're going to be holding a uh, series of webinars over the next few months with uh, different companies talking about different aspects of cross-border sellings. The next event is not announced yet, but we'll be sending around the invitations uh, when that's uh, settled down. We will be sending out a, a questionnaire to all of the attendees uh, regarding what you'd like to see as a, a possible topic of the next webinar or the next uh, actual seminar in London. And of course, if you'd like to follow up with questions with any of the presenters, just respond to any of the emails from the invitations. And we'd be happy to get in touch with you to answer any specific questions that you may have. So uh, if you have a question that you'd like to put to the group or submit privately, you can use the chat box. We're going to remain online for the next uh, couple of minutes. If uh, you'd like to speak to someone, you can again just put it into the chat box or the question and we'll hang on the line and speak to you individually as well. So thank you very much for attending. I hope there were a number of takeaways there uh, in the different areas of e-commerce, e-commerce technology, uh, VAT and tax liability, shipping and fulfillment, and social media. So again, thank you very much for attending and hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you. <laughs>